just no point. What they're doing right now is lost. Luke, thank you for joining us, man. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> he didn't say it. He didn't say it. Luke! Hey. What? You can say it on the Skype, but you can't tell me you love me on TV? DC, you are my man. I love you, Luke. <laughs> Luke Rockhold is a man of great conflict. He's an introvert, but it seems like he really, desperately wants to be that guy. He wants to be the left body kicking, name taking assassin of the middleweight division. But in reality, he's an introvert. He doesn't know what to do with his hands. He just wants to shrug a lot, surf, and live his life. This conflict very much reflects his fighting style. He's a southpaw who loves his left body kick. You can tell he wants to carve his opponents up on the feet. He wants that staple knockout. But it's in his nature to grapple. The man is at his best when he's jumping on your back and beating the ever-loving fuck out of you on the ground. Today, in advance of his fight with Paulo Costa at UFC 278, we take a brief look at Luke Rockhold's BJJ skills, because few can do it better than Mr. Big Dick himself. <laughs> You see, Luke Rockhold can't hit particularly good takedowns. It's why Jan Blahovic brained him with a left hook. But if these dummies are gullible enough to shoot in on him, it starts getting sexy. Here, Wyman catches Rockhold's inside low kick and tries to cut the angle to finish a double. Rockhold immediately wraps up the head and uses a knee shield to sweep Wyman as the two men hit the canvas. From here, he starts chasing an arm in guillotine before ending up in Wyman's guard. Of course, we all know the infamous spinning wheel kick. Chris Wyman was having a bunch of success with the body kicks, whilst Luke was clearly starting to gas. And then Wyman decided he was going to throw a lazy spinning wheel kick, give up his back, and, well, the rest is history. Rockhold secured back control, both hooks in, before transitioning to a crushing mount where he rained down a hellacious beating upon the incumbent champ. When the two came back out for round four, Luke made the best decision of his career. Take the shot. He did, in fact, take the shot. Rockhold was able to elevate Wyman for the body lock takedown, and he was able to continue to land hard elbows and punches until Herb Dean mercifully stopped the fight whilst Rockhold was in an exceedingly dominant three-quarter mount with Wyman pressed up against the fence. The UFC's stats indicate that Rockhold landed 126 significant strikes over the course of the fight. 73 of those strikes came on the ground. Despite this fact, Rockhold only shot officially four times, successfully completing two of those. Three of those takedown attempts came in the fourth when he had Wyman pressed up to the fence. Comparatively, Wyman shot for six takedowns over the course of the bout. This is the conflict. Luke Rockhold's work on the ground was stellar, and yet he himself could barely bring the fight to the mat. It was Wyman's own tomfoolery that allowed Rockhold to set up his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, let me tell you a story about David Branch. The World Series of Fighting alum came to the UFC, had a middling performance against perennial journeyman Christoph Jocko, and then got his opportunity to show the world his skill versus Rockhold in a main event slot in Rockhold's first fight since losing the belt to Bisping. I mean, he's going to come out and try to establish his dominance. You know, he's going to try to run his alpha male shit on me, you know, and I'm going to shut that shit down, obviously. But, like, you know, I, I think that in that fight with Bisping, the motherfucker slipped up, you know. You can't go out there and take anybody lightly. He talked his shit, and he was kind of right. As such, Branch's game plan was to exploit Rockhold striking, catching the kicks and putting Luke on his heels. Here, Rockhold goes to the counter hook as Branch is closing in, but Branch rolls with the shot and lands a follow-up right hand. That same right hand lands a minute and a half later in a similar fashion. Counter hook gets beaten by Branch's right hand. But every time Branch found success on the feet, he'd initiate a clinch. After that first exchange, he dropped for a double and took Rockhold down. And as good as David Branch is as a grappler, he couldn't keep Rockhold on the mat. After landing that second right hand halfway through the round, he shoots double underhooks and tries to strip Rockhold's left leg, lands some pitter-patter body shots, and he gets reversed. And then Rockhold separates. It's like these two are desperate to fight in the way that is completely antithetical to the strengths they're exhibiting. In the final minute of the round, Rockhold initiates a clinch when he's backed onto the fence, and lo and behold, he's able to turn into an elevated lat drop. 
and the whole time he's on top. You're thinking to yourself, why the fuck didn't you do this earlier, Luke? I know your takedowns are trash, but you're clearly stronger than Branch. The second round is kind of the same. Luke is switching orthodox to land the outside low kick and he gets countered off of it. Gets his right hook countered with Branch's right hook. Eats a powerful open side body kick. And then Branch clinches again. FOR FUCK'S SAKE! It takes Rockhold about 31 seconds to turn Branch's back to the cage and from there he starts having success. After another takedown from double underhooks, Luke goes from side control to mount and within a minute and a half, Rockhold has secured a submission by rear mounted strikes. That's how good this dude can be. Like Weidman, David Branch is another Henzo Gracie black belt, and Luke Rockhold just completely dismantled him. When opponents opt to take him down early, we get some beautiful stuff, like how Tim Bowe shot a single off of Luke raising his leg, and Luke immediately secured Tim's trailing leg before rolling across Tim's back to end up sprawled hard on the back. Please, watch this again, it's too hot. <laughs> He then wraps up an inverted triangle, which immediately puts Bosch on the defensive. It's worth noting that this is one of Luke's calling cards in the gym. Back in 2015, multiple time ADCC and IBJJF champion Marcus Buchecha stated in an interview that, in my opinion, Luke has the best ground game in MMA out of all the athletes I've trained with. He went on to explain that Luke has a different game, dangerous, with footlocks and inverted triangles. So what does Bosch try to do? Well, he tries to complete the single. You can see him here, trying to slowly cut across and pull Luke's left knee out. But Luke's posting with his left arm and sitting high on the neck. Rockhold starts blasting mean elbows and then Bosch nearly manages to complete his single leg. But Rockhold's again too high and Bosch has no control over the hips. Rockhold underhooks the far leg and that allows him to prevent Bosch from completing the takedown. So, thus far, we're only a minute and a half into this fight, and already, Rockhold is trying to get the Kimura. Bosch nullifies it briefly by putting his back to the mat, but it isn't long before Rockhold sits back up and is able to then properly crank the submission. He gets the tap two minutes and eight seconds into the first round. Domination. But what happens when Rockhold does want to impose his ground game, but is incapable of getting his man down? Introducing Jan Blahovic. Luke actually went for the takedown here. Less than 30 seconds into the fight, he had shot for a double and was trying to do what he usually does, strip the leg and elevate his opponent. He didn't get much success with that. He almost got Yarn down here, stepping in front of the left leg while pulling Yarn down with the body lock, but Yarn was able to build his base back up almost immediately. Rockhold then goes for the same takedown attempt, but then switches to the front headlock instead. But he doesn't control Yarn's hips, and as he's trying to pull Yarn down, he has to bail on the takedown because he has no leverage left. In the clinch, Yarn did everything right, and Luke wasn't as frenetic as he needed to be. Yarn even landed a few cheeky elbows here and there in the clinch. Eventually, Rockhold has to give up on the grappling, and Yarn nearly lands this left hook as they exit. Fortunately for Luke, this one misses. Just you wait. Just you wait. Back on the feet, Luke was looking tired, and his sometimes one-note offense reared its head. While some of the left high kicks found their mark, Luke's inside low kick was checked most of the time. Jan jabbed the body very effectively, and was countering the straight left with the inside slip jab. Jan also landed his customary straight right jab step up body kick that butchered Dominic Reyes's body, who is also a southpaw. Also, look at this. Jan pulls an aldo and retracts the shin to avoid the outside low kick before countering with the left hook over the top. How close is that? It got a lot closer in the round's final exchange when Luke got caught with a rear hand uppercut into a left hook, which put Rockhold on skates. Still, that hook can get closer. Do you remember how Luke got lazy exiting the clinch and nearly got his chin rearranged by this left hook in the first round? Well... That's Luke Rockhold for you. He's so goddamn talented, but he's also, sometimes, really goddamn one note. It's infuriating. But hey, he's still a damn good fighter, no matter what. Watch his five round war with Jacare from Strikeforce for proof. Watch the way that he butchered Lyoto Machida in two rounds. Yes, he has identifiable weapons that can be exploited, as Michael Bisping did by countering Luke's right hook with a left hook over the top in their rematch. But he remains an incredibly dangerous athlete regardless. Let us just pray that his takedowns have gotten better since his fight with Blahovich. 
Und This weekend, Rockhold steps into the octagon to fight Paulo Costa, one of the more dangerous men in the middleweight division. Now, we've previously covered Paulo Costa's style in depth, both in the comprehensive guide to Israel Adesanya and in the post-fight breakdown for UFC 253. For a better exploration of the Brazilian style, look to those videos. As to how he matches up with Luke, it's interesting. The losses to Marvin Vittori and Israel Adesanya were very different losses, and they both tell us some interesting things. Against Israel, Paulo struggled with the sheer variety of feints from the champion and had difficulties pressing forward as Israel was using the jab feint to set up both the outside low kicks and oblique kicks to Paulo's lead thigh. Paulo couldn't bully Israel on the fence because Israel is so effective at flattening his stance and feinting in both directions to escape. And because Israel fought much of the fight in orthodox, Costa's usual body kick to the open side wasn't there. When it did present itself, Izzy often caught it. Versus Vittori, it was more a case of Paulo getting outstruck in volume. He still had issues covering up for single shots, as he did with Uriah Hall, and he was repeatedly stung with right hooks over the top, Vittori's surprisingly well-utilized jab, the straight left, as well as Vittori's own left kick to the body. But he also brought some tremendous power. The only reason he didn't knock Vittori out is because the Italian dream has a cinder block for a head. It's worth noting, I believe that Luke Rockhold's recent chin issues are exaggerated. He got knocked out by a heavy-handed Jan Blahovic and flattened by one of the most powerful middleweights of all time in Yoel Romero. The Bisping knockout was more a product of perfect timing from the Brit. These do not make a bad chin. And with three years off, his chin should be fine. Technically, what does Rockhold need to watch out for? He needs to avoid leaning too far to the inside because there's a chance he might get flattened by leaning into Costa's right body or high kick. He needs to look out for that monstrous right straight that Costa was having success with versus Vittori. He needs to be very careful getting caught with Costa's counter left hook as he steps in with his jab or his sometimes overcommitted straight left. See, for example, Costa's first round knockdown of Yoel Romero. Most importantly, he has to be actively working. He needs to show an improved jab because that's what Costa struggles with most. Force the Brazilian to cover up and then throw the inside low kick. Naked inside low kicks like he was throwing against Blahovic will get his head taken off. And if he does that shifting straight left that you'll often see, he needs to get into the clinch quickly off of it. When he breaks from the clinch, same thing. He needs to do it fast and without dropping his hands. He cannot get stuck with his back to the fence because that's when Costa starts throwing combinations and his hooks to the body from both sides are insane. Not to mention his rear hand uppercut that he'll throw at the end of exchanges. If Luke can stay in the middle, pump his jab, throw his left body kick and high kicks and avoid getting backed up, he's got a shot. Vittori did score a body lock takedown in the second round versus Costa, so that might be an option for Luke too, particularly given that's his go-to takedown for the most part. But regardless, this is do or die for the hunkiest man in Santa Cruz. If he loses here, it will have been nearly five years since his last win. For fans of Rockhold, this weekend is going to be a hard stopper. That's why we love this guy. For all his intense braggadocio, he's an introvert who believes in himself, despite all the injuries and bullshit. And when it comes to a fight, he's damn entertaining. You have to appreciate the best power bottom in the game.